we can treat it if we know early enough. There's such a stigma about herpes simplex virus. Your result is only as good as the swab you take. Hello and welcome to the Peds Round. We host a regular podcast from the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health on key issues affecting paediatric practice. My name is Emma Lim and I'm a consultant paediatrician at the Great North Children's Hospital in Newcastle-upon-Tyne. I'm here today with my co-host and colleague Christo Tsipilis and this is our final episode of three on herpes simplex virus HSV. And today we're looking to round up our learning from what we've heard before from Sarah and Dr. Hermione Lyle. So let's get started with today's round and hear from Dr. Katie Fiddler. A great friend and colleague of mine who I've known for a very long time. Katie, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, Hi Emma, Uh, I'm As you know, I'm Katie Fiddler. I'm a paediatric infectious disease consultant in Brighton and a reader at Brighton and Sussex Medical School. And also I currently run the national study on neonatal herpes through the BPSU. Katie, what do you want to tell doctors about when to worry about HSV and what to look out for? Well, uh, neonatal HSV can present in one of three different ways with skin, eye and mouth disease with a CNS disease, so encephalitis, or with disseminated disease. And for the first two of these, presentation may be easy to recognize because they have skin lesions or they may present with fevers and seizures. But it's this last group with disseminated disease that it's really, really difficult to recognize because they present with very nonspecific symptoms of poor feeding, lethargy. Uh, They may present with uh, a sepsis picture, but everybody will think they've got bacterial sepsis and not think about treatable viral sepsis. Thanks, Katie. I think the difficulty is, is that basically babies don't present in many different ways. Like they either get a fever or they cry or parents come in and say they're just not themselves. So is there any time you shouldn't use acyclovir? Because it seems to me that it would be really hard to unpick beforehand whether this is an HSV infection or not. I think that's a very good question, Emma, about when you shouldn't use acyclovir. From an infectious disease point of view, we would like to consider HSV and starting acyclovir in pretty much the same way as you do antibiotics that you start and then you can stop when the cultures are negative antibiotics or the viral PCR tests are negative for HSV. Um, However, we have to put that into the context of many, many babies presenting to the emergency department and how that would affect thousands of babies per year. Yeah, and I think that brings us back to that reminder that Hermione talked about us to take a really good history and to talk to the parents. I think the second problem is, is that we don't have good point of care tests. So what we really would love is a point of care test that will tell us if a child has HSV, herpes simplex virus, when you see them as that slightly sleepy, lethargic, possibly febrile infant. And at that moment, point of care tests don't exist like that. But what tests can you do or what tests should you do, Katie? Well, I think the most important thing is to go back one stage. And even before the testing, you have to think of the diagnosis to send off the tests. And we've done studies to show that when you ask registrars uh, what diagnoses they consider in an unwell baby presenting in the first week of life, only 3% think of HSV, whereas everybody will think of bacterial sepsis. 
For instance, everyone thinks of listeria. However, listeria is not nearly as common as HSV in the neonatal population. I think that's incredible because the number of listeria cases in neonatal population is in maybe two figures per year, like tens or twenties. Yes. So we we know that both uh, junior doctors and indeed the public are all very aware of listeria infection, but hardly anybody is aware of herpes simplex infections in neonates and what they can do to reduce their risk of babies getting infected. And I think that really goes back to that idea that there's such a stigma about herpes simplex virus. Yeah, I think there's still a huge stigma around it. And it's such a shame because, of course, uh, it would turn neonatal herpes into a much more easily pre pre treatable disease. Uh, doctors should ask women in pregnancy and those who are presenting in the emergency department if they have a history of this illness, because we can treat it if we know early enough. And it's that horrible com combination of being completely stigmatised to talk about genital herpes and then also disregarding cold sores as anything serious. So most people don't bother to treat cold sores and don't think that cold sores are in any way dangerous. Yes, and I think Hamani talked very nicely about what we can do to prevent these infections. And of course, prevention is better than cure. And she talked about the antenatal things we can do. But of course, between 10 and 25% of these infections are acquired postnatally. And we really need to educate parents and staff in hospitals about the importance of postnatal transmission of herpes from a cold sore lesion or a hepatic whitlow. Uh, and uh, providing uh, advice about how not to work with newborns or touch newborns if you have these lesions. And what does a hepatic whitlow actually look like? Well, it looks almost like blisters, on, often on the side of your finger, but it can also present like a paronychia, so redness around the nail bed, and it's often confused for a bacterial infection. Let's imagine we live in the world where you can have anything you want, what are the tests that you really dream about if you're concerned about HSV? Well, in my dream world, we'd have a point of care test like we have for COVID these days uh, to look whether a baby has herpes infection when they initially present. So we can treat with antivirals at that point. But we don't. So what's our second best real world scenario? So then we want to think of the diagnosis and take samples from as many sites as possible. Many people think of taking a CSF and sending this for HSV, PCR, along with enterovirus and some of the other viral infections. However, we really, really want to catch these babies when they're at the viremic stage before the virus is disseminated. And therefore, we have to take a blood sample, which is an EDTA, looking for herpes simplex PCR. So this is not the antibody test, the serum clotted test, which shows your response to herpes. We really want people to send off the viral DNA sample on admission. What can you tell me about the kind of swabs we'd like? Well, we want the viral swab, which in our hospital is a green swab, not a charcoal swab. And it's the same swab, of course, everybody knows about for COVID these days. Um, and what I would suggest is any baby with any skin lesions, it, you may think it's erythema toxicum, you may think it's a staph infection, but please, please send that viral swab as well. And you may get a surprise. This means you could start treatment earlier. If we were to hit the jackpot and have every investigation that we wish for that actually exists at the moment, we would like a CSF PCR. We would like a blood PCR. That's an EDTA tube. And we would like viral swabs of absolutely everything. So any blisters, any lesions, any redness, and that swab 
would be a viral swab, which would be a green swab, not a charcoal bacterial swab. Katie, is there any value in popping blisters to get some of the fluid inside the vesicle yeah. for the swabs? Yes, I think we would like to pop the blister and really try and get that green swab into the base of the blister, even if it causes a little bit of discomfort for the baby. Your result is only as good as the swab you take. Well, it's a bugbear of mine that I've been training our juniors about for research studies on meningococcal disease to doing COVID swabs. If you don't get your swab to the back of the throat, or in this case, to the base of the lesion, a negative result does not necessarily mean anything. Katie, going back to our investigations, remember this is a baby who doesn't necessarily have a fever, who may look just a bit sleepy. We've talked about what investigations we'd like to try and isolate a virus, but what other tests would you like to do? Well, tests that are very helpful would be the CRP, and that's usually low in herpes simplex virus. Liver function tests, because once your ALT starts to rise, your risk of mortality increases significantly. And clotting, because again, this can go off in these babies. Okay, so we have a list of all the investigations we'd like. Uh, do we need to talk about treatment? I'd love to talk about treatment. I think it's very difficult and a contentious area at the moment. Although we like vitamin A and cyclovir, we'd like to give it to everybody. It's a bit like thinking about antimicrobial stewardship and we need to think who needs to have it. Or we could start it on more children and then stop it if we've done the right investigations. I agree with you. It's always difficult to give. We always struggle with cannulas. And I don't think there's any, I don't think I have a good answer for that. I think any unwell baby in which mum has any history of herpes at all, we would treat. Any baby who is unwell with non-specific signs of infection or sepsis, it would be good to treat. And any certainly any baby who has abnormal liver function tests or deranged coagulopathy or who is not getting better after 24 to 48 hours of, or, of IV antibiotics. And I think you were particularly interested in babies who are under 16 days old in the first few weeks of life. Yes, so we're conducting a national study at the moment, and it does seem that the median age of presentation with disseminated disease is about six days. With skin, eye and mouth, it's eight days. And with encephalitis, it's 10 days. We worry a lot about antimicrobial resistance. Um, do we need to be concerned about acyclovir resistance in HSV? We're lucky at the moment that we don't seem to see a cyclovir resistance very often in women who are treated or children who are treated with a cyclovir. We're still standing. I'm going to give you five minutes to tell us about the BPSU study that you have just recently finished. So that is the British Paediatric Surveillance Unit, which we were just talking about a bit earlier. Yes, yeah, so this is a study we've been running over the last couple of years uh, where we look at all anonymous uh, cases of neonatal herpes in the first few months of life uh, in the UK and Ireland. Well, we have interim results to date. Uh, the study's not fully concluded yet, but we have found most importantly that the incidence of neonatal herpes infection has doubled again since the last study that Sarah mentioned that was undertaken about 20 years ago. Fabulous. So that means I have to talk to you again. Another excuse to come and meet up. And finally, thank you so much for being with us, Katie, and for the enormous amount of work you've done in this area. And I think it's such an important area because of the lack of recognition and awareness of horrible disease and the possibility that it could be avoided through a few questions and maternal prophylaxis. So, do you have three top tips that you'd like to share with our listeners? Three top tips are really that antenatal transmission can be reduced 
as discussed by Hermani. Postnatal transmission can be reduced by good hygiene and not touching babies if you have a cold sore or a hepatic whitlow. And lastly, we can reduce mortality if a baby does get infected by treating them early with acyclovir. And the key to this is really thinking of HSV as a possible diagnosis. So as you know, Emma, I've been badgering you for years to talk about treatable causes of viral sepsis as well as bacterial sepsis. And I think everybody thinks of things like enterovirus and RSV and viruses that you can't really give specific treatment to. You just have supportive care. But herpes simplex is one of those viruses that you can completely alter the course of the disease if you treat these babies early. I mustn't be forgotten. Thank you, Katie. It's the day of the virus. Your time has come. Uh, I really <laughs> appreciate it. And it's been great fun to talk to you all. And we probably should make a date to come and chat again once you've got all the results from the BPS News study. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me on your podcast. Thank you very much, Katie. That's amazing. And as always, we add all our links on our show notes. For guidelines under management, please look for the UK Paediatric Antimicrobial Stewardship Group. This can be found at https dot slash slash uk slash pas dot co dot uk at the time of our recording the guidelines for the treatment of neonatal herpes simplex were being updated the general consensus among the uk paediatric antimicrobial stewardship network is based on dr fidlett's current British Paediatric Surveillance Unit data. The UK PAS guidelines for neonatal herpes simplex have now been updated. It is recommended for acyclovir to be used in the treatment of neonates with suspected sepsis and any of the following features. Number one, ALT or AST greater than two times the upper limit of normal or abnormal liver function tests. Number two, coagulopathy. Number three, vesicles. Number four, seizures. Number five, CSF pleocytosis. Number six, suspected meningitis or encephalitis. Number seven, recent maternal herpes simplex virus disease. Number eight, postnatal contact with HSV. The recommendations also strongly recommend considering acyclovir in neonates who present on days 3 to 14 with one of the following in the absence of the above risk factors, no obvious cause, not improving or unexplained maternal febrile illness peripartum to 14 days postpartum, especially if premature. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the episode. This podcast is a collaboration between MediSense Medical Education and the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health. You can find more creative learning resources on www.medisense.org.uk and of course a wealth of information on the important work of RCPCH on rcpch.ac.uk or hashtag choose pediatrics. The views, thoughts and opinions expressed in this podcast relate solely to the speaker and not necessarily to their employer, organisation, the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health or any other group or individual.